Hello friends. Welcome back to this second session on an approach to chest pain where we discussed 10 quick questions that you need to ask a patient who presents with chest pain while you're evaluating them in an emergency department or in a hospital casualty. So in the first part of this video, we talked about uh, the causes of chest pain and the historical approach to the identifying the cause of this chest pain. In this second part, we are going to talk about some specific considerations in the evaluation, and we will develop a comparative table for different causes of chest pain. Let's start with uh, the considerations in the evaluation of chest pain and how you would like to approach this patient. So there are four different questions that you have in mind when you're trying to approach this patient. You want to find out with a quick history whether you are dealing with an urgent and life-threatening situation. Are you dealing with an acute situation which is specifically treatable? Or are you dealing with a chronic condition which is otherwise serious? Or you are treating a chronic disease which has got a treatment? So the aim of your evaluation is largely to classify the condition that the patient has presented with into one of these four kinds of classifications. Is it urgent and life-threatening? Is it acute but treatable? Is it chronic but serious? Or is it chronic and treatable? In the urgent and life-threatening category, we have unstable angina acute myocardial infarction, an aortic dissection, a pulmonary embolism, or a pneumothorax. In acute and treatable causes, this could be a pleural disease, such as a pleural effusion. It could be a pericardial disease, like a pericarditis. It could be a pneumonia. It could be a herpes zoster infection. Under the chronic conditions, which could be serious, we could be dealing with a stable angina, we could be dealing with an aortic stenosis, or we could be dealing with a chronic pulmonary hypertension. Among the chronic but otherwise treatable conditions, we would have gastroesophageal reflux disease, we would have peptic ulcer disease, we could have gallbladder colic, we could have costochondritis, or musculoskeletal pains. So the reason for assessing and evaluating a patient is to classify them into one of these four conditions. So like we said, urgent and life-threatening could be a myocardial infarction, an aortic dissection, a pneumothorax, or a pulmonary embolism. In acute MI, the pain is retrosternal, is associated with diaphoresis, the patient is pale, says that there is a sense of impending doom, and there are so many other features which we tried and elicited in the first part of this session. In aortic dissection, the patient would present with shock. There may be tamponade, there may be aortic regurgitation murmur, which may be found. In a pneumothorax, the patient will have rapidly increasing dyspnea. There would be bulging of the chest. The patient may be cyanosed, and there would be absent breath sounds on examination. In case of a pulmonary embolism, the pain would be pleuritic in nature. The patient would have dyspnea, breathlessness. He would have a tachycardia. Heart rate would increase. Blood pressure may be very high or very low, depending upon how severe the uh, pulmonary embolism is. The patient may have hemoptysis. And on an ECG, you would find an S1, Q3, T3 pattern. That means that in lead one, you have an S wave. In lead three, you have a Q wave, which is present. And in lead three, again, you have an inverted T wave. So this is um, easily to remember, referred to as an S1, Q3, T3 pattern, and is seen in patients with pulmonary embolism. There could be acute and treatable causes, which could be pleural-based. Patient may have effusion. Patient may have empyma, where there is pus between the pleural cavity. There is pleuritis, that means there is inflammation of the pleura and friction causes pain. There is an abscess in the chest. There is pneumothorax. 
there could be pericardial causes, there could be a pneumonia, and there could be herpes zoster infection. We will look more at them in a little bit. There could be chronic but serious conditions in which the patient could have a stable angina. There could be an aortic stenosis and the patient could have a pulmonary hypertension, which is long-standing. Again, all these are serious situations. So this is a picture of a herpes zoster infection where you can see vesicular lesions which are present. They never cross the midline. There is a strong dermatomal distribution. If you see, they are distributed in a dermatomal pattern and they cause burning pain. This is another uh, picture of herpes zoster lesion where you can see the vesicular lesion in this region. There could be chronic but treatable causes of chest pain, which could be a gastroesophageal reflux disease, a peptic ulcer disease, a gallbladder colic. There could be arthritis or a cervical disc disease. The patient could have costochondritis, a musculoskeletal pain, and there could be anxiety neurosis, which could be the cause of this pain. So the idea is try and differentiate all of these different uh, categories of pain. Put the pain into one of these categories and then act and react accordingly. Now let's try and develop a comparative table which will help us identify different types of chest pain as we view them in a hospital or in a clinic or when the patient lands up in an emergency. Before we go on to the comparative table, I'm going to once again run through the different causes of chest pain. The most important category that we always want to identify is myocardial ischemia or injury, which could have a spectrum starting from a chronic stable angina, going through unstable angina up to myocardial infarction. There could be other myocardial diseases or a pericardial involvement in terms of a pericarditis, a tamponade, a myocarditis, or a cardiomyopathy. There could be acute aortic syndromes, in the form of aortic aneurysm, dissection, penetrating ulcers, or an intramural hematoma. There could be pulmonary causes from the lung, which could include a pulmonary embolism, a pneumothorax, pneumonia, malignancy, or a chronic pulmonary hypertension. There could be gastroesophageal causes, which could include a gastroesophageal reflux disease, a peptic ulcer disease, a malary or esophageal rupture, cholecystitis, biliary colic, or pancreatitis. There could be a musculoskeletal and other disorders such as costochondritis, sprain, and herpes zoster. And there could be an emotional and psychiatric component to the chest pain. Now please uh, try and identify this color scheme in which I have put myocardial injury in purple, pericardial and other myocardial diseases in blue, aortic syndromes in, in brown, pulmonary features in kind of shade of red, gastroesophageal causes in green, musculoskeletal in gray and black. And this is the scheme that we are following and going to follow across the table, which is coming up in the next slide. So in this table, we are trying to identify different features of uh, different diseases. So we will be talking about these differential diagnoses in particular. Obviously, it is very difficult to cover all the comprehensive differential diagnoses, but we will try and eliminate the chest pain into herpes, musculoskeletal disorders, costochondritis, gastritis, GERD or esophagitis, pleuritis or pleurisy, pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, pericarditis, acute aortic syndromes, myocardial infarction, or angina. So here we have pulmonary causes. In this, we have the cardiac causes here, and we have gastric as well as musculoskeletal and others here. The questions to be asked in these individuals are about the onset, about aggravating and relieving factors, about the location of the chest pain, where does it radiate to, what is the character of chest pain, what is the associated features and what are the predisposing features that this person may have as a part of this chest pain syndrome. 
let's talk about the onset. There can be two different kinds of onset. Largely, the patient could have an acute onset or a sudden onset. Usually, when you find that the patient has a sudden onset of a pain whose intensity peaks immediately, you are largely, largely looking at either a pneumothorax, a pulmonary embolism, or an acute aortic dissection. All these three are very critical emergencies. And if you do not act immediately, instantly, in seconds, then you might lose the patient if you keep waiting to prove the diagnosis. And if you're not sure and you're not confident of your history-taking skills, patients presenting with tension pneumothorax who present with a sudden chest pain and the intensity has peaked immediately and you are sure that this patient has a pneumothorax, you might need to do a needle thoracotomy or thoracostomy immediately at that time as soon as you see this patient, otherwise you may lose them. The next question to ask is aggravating or relieving factors. Exercise usually leads to aggravating musculoskeletal as well as myocardial infarction, angina, where you find exercise, stress, sexual intercourse, which increase the pain. In angina, the pain is relieved by rest and it is relieved by nitroglycerin. Any movement tends to aggravate costochondritis or even musculoskeletal pain. The patient could say that the aggravation is by reclining or when taking alcohol, then you're looking at something like a gastroesophageal reflux disease or an esophagitis. The patient could say that the pain is aggravated by deep breathing. That means the moment he starts taking a deep breath, he has to stop the breath in between because it causes a sharp shooting pain. Here you are practically certain that you are dealing with a pleuritis or a pleurisy. A pneumothorax could be precipitated by a trauma, although sometimes this could be even spontaneous. Pericarditis is often worse in the supine position that the patient finds relief if he sits up and leans forward, and that's when the friction is decreased and the pain is also decreased. You should ask the patient next about the location of the pain. So a herpetic pain is always dermatomal in distribution, does not cross the midline. It will be on one side of the midline. The musculoskeletal pain is localized to the area of injury. The costochondritis again is localized in the sternal or in the parasternal area. Gastritis is all often uh, located in the eso, uh, eso, uh, epigastric area and may radiate into the retrosternal area. Pleuritis is lateralized to the site of pleural involvement and is highly localized. The patient can often pinpoint it with their fingers. A pneumothorax is lateralized to one side of the pneumothorax injury, or similarly, the pulmonary embolism is also lateralized to the site of the, um, the pathology. A myocardial infarction and angina are often retrosternal. A Levine sign is when the patient makes a fist and puts it against his chest to try and indicate uh, when you see a patient, let's say a 55, 60 year old male patient sitting like this with, a, uh, with his fist held close to his heart, his precordium and retrosternal area, then you're looking at a Levine sign, which is characteristic of an angina or a myocardial infarction. When you ask about the radiation of pain, the gastro, uh, uh, gastritis pain will get referred or uh, radiate to the re uh, retrosternal area. Pain from a pulmonary embolism could radiate or get referred to the shoulder if the diaphragmatic pleura is involved. A pericardial pain often gets referred or radiates to the trapezius ridge and an acute aortic dissection radiates to the back and often between the two shoulder blades. A myocardial infarction, interestingly, can uh, radiate to the jaw, to the shoulder, or um, and even up to the hand. Usually, a myocardial infarction or an angina will not go above the mandible. 
if the pain is going to the face above the mandible, then you stop thinking of other causes, including trigeminal neuralgia, rather than a myocardial infarction. The next question to ask this individual is the character of this pain. In herpes, often it is sharp pain, which is burning. Musculoskeletal and costochondritis also have a sharp nature of pain, as is seen in a pulmonary embolism in a pericarditis, where it is sharp knife-like sensation in addition to just being sharp. In a pleuritis, again, it is a sharp pricking or a knife-like sensation which the person can point out. So a lot of pains will have a sharp character when the person is described, describing them and often sometimes the description is not very clear. A pneumothorax can have a pleuritic nature of pain, but the more characteristic lesions or nature of pain that we often find is when the patient says there is a tearing or a ripping pain that occurs in aortic dissection. Or when the myocardial pain is suspected, it's less dramatic. It's more of a heaviness, a dull aching sensation in the chest, which could be felt as squeezing or constricting. And both myocardial infarction and angina would have this kind of a presentation. But please do remember that oftentimes the patient with myocardial infarction or angina will just give a dull, vague sensation and will not even be able to define a particular character of their pain. The next thing that you need to see or ask the patient is the association. So it is often said the man is known by a company he keeps. So any man is known by the company he keeps and any Chest pain is also known by the company that chest pain keeps and other associated findings or features that you may wish to evaluate at that point of time. Musculoskeletal, it occurs with movement. Gastroesophageal uh, pain is associated with an abdominal fullness or eructations. Pleuritis may be associated with cough. Pneumothorax may be associated with dyspnea and cyanosis. A pulmonary embolism may be associated with a syncope, tachycardia, hypotension, or even hemoptysis. An acute aortic syndrome or aortic dissection may have a very high blood pressure or a very low blood pressure, depending on the location and the severity of the pathology. A myocardial infarction will often complain of a sense of impending doom, and these patients will present with kabrahat, anxiety, palpitations, sweating and other features. You quickly do want to know the predisposing features that the patient may have in, in relation to all these kinds of diagnosis. And an immunodeficient person is predisposed to herpes. Exercise or uh, heavy exercise predisposes to sprains, pulls and musculoskeletal pains. And obese sedentary verca is predisposed to gastritis but at the same time, an obese sedentary worker is also predisposed to an angina or a myocardial infarction. A male smoker who has a family history of pneumothorax or has Marfan syndrome is predisposed to a pneumothorax. A person who's had a recent surgery or a trauma has had a long distance travel or a deep venous thrombosis and has hypercoagulable state is predisposed to a pulmonary embolism. A hypertensive or a pregnant lady or a boy with a Marfan's or an Ehlers-Danlos syndrome would be predisposed to an aortic dissection. Whereas a person who's elderly, male, smokes, is hypertensive, diabetic, is having dyslipidemia, a family history of premature cardiac disease, there is obesity and a sedentary occupation then you would want to bring the picture of angina into your mind and you should always be sensitized and looking forward to this. Let's look at further features of these when you examine the patient. In general examination, in a herpetic patient, you will find vesicular lesions as we just saw. In a pleuritic patient, you may find that there is incomplete inspiration. He can't take deep breaths. You will find an increased respiratory rate and a lot of respiratory distress in pneumothorax. 
tachycardia is a feature of a pulmonary embolism. You might find a tachycardia, a raised JVP, a small sign, a pulses paradoxus in pericarditis, of which has got associated tamponade. If the person comes with pallor or a hypotension, you would be finding or looking for an aortic dissection. If you find that there is increase or decrease heart rate, this could be a feature of angina. And again, a pallor or ashen face or a pale face could be a, a feature of a myocardial infarction. On inspection in herpes, you find the telltale vesicular lesions. You find inflamed areas, redness, pay, uh, pallor, calor, dolor, and tumor, or swelling and redness in musculoskeletal uh, sprains and injuries. You could find inflammation in costochondritis. If you find that the patient captures his breath in deep inspiration, you're thinking, and you're almost certain that you're dealing with a pleuritis. If there's a chest bulge, and the trachea is shifted, then definitely you're looking at a pleural or a, or a parenchymal lung pathology, and you want to look for a pneumothorax in this kind of a patient. When you are palpating, you might find tenderness in musculoskeletal or costochondrial disorders, and you will find decrease in the movements of the chest in, in, in pneumothorax. In percussion, while you're dealing with a pneumothorax, you will find a hyper-resonant area or a tympanic note on the chest. While auscultating in pleuritis, you might find a pleural rub. If you find absent breath sounds, then you are looking at a pneumothorax. If you find a pericardial rub, you are immediately sensitized to a pericarditis. Aortic regurgitation should start, make, uh, should start you to think towards an aortic dissection if you are not thinking about that already. If you're auscultating an S4 uh, heart sound, then you're looking at a myocardial infarction. There are some specific features that we often look for in an ECG. Like we said, in a pulmonary embolism, it's an S1, Q3, T3 pattern. In a pericarditis, you find a tachycardia and you find an elevated ST segment with a concavity upwards. In an angina, you have symmetrical T wave inversions you have ST depressions. In a myocardial infarction, you may have Q waves and you have an ST segment elevation. Similarly, on an X-ray, you might find uh, specific signs in, in, uh, uh, in the X-ray. Costochondritis may present with inflammation, although this is not uh, regularly seen. Pleuritis will present with a small effusion or a large effusion, depending upon how big it is. But often when the large effusion has already set in, then the pleuritic pain would tend to disappear because the friction between the two pleural surfaces would have gone. A pneumothorax, there will be increased hyperlucency. There would be no bronchovascular markings and trachea will be deviated to the opposite side of the pneumothorax. In pulmonary embolism, you would find a Westermark sign, a Pallas sign or a Hampton's hump we will see them in a, just a little bit in the next slides. In pericardial tamponade, you might find a pericardial effusion uh, or a pericardial calcification if it's a long-standing chronic calcific pericarditis. In aortic dissection, depending upon the location of the dissection, it is possible to find mediastinal widening. So I hope between these two tables, you would have been able to make some sense of different diseases which may present with chest pain. So as I promised, this, this picture shows a Hampton's hum. If you look at this, uh, this area here, this is a pleural-based opacity, which is a dome-shaped pleural op opacification. And this uh, apex, which was supposed to be sharp and triangular, is blunted because there is a rounding of the apex and because this is, there is a collateral blood supply. This was identified by Aubrey Otis Hampton between 1900 and 1955, who was an American radiologist. So that's the Hampton's hump for you. There's a Westermark sign and the Pala sign. Here, if you look at this area of the X-ray, you find that there are bronchovascular markings are much less. This is what we called a focal oligemia, and we find 
that there is area of hyperlucency here. This is called the Western mark signs. And then there is the pallor sign. If you look at the pulmonary artery here, it is enlarged and appears to be roughly sausage shaped. Antonio Palla was a radiologist, an Italian radiologist who was born in 1949 and who has uh, who found that there were 25% of patients with pulmonary embolism who had an enlarged right descending pulmonary artery with a sausage shaped appearance. And when present with Westermark sign, it indicates that a low bar artery has been blocked and the smaller arteries supplying the lungs have also been blocked. Here, this is a, a feature of acute MI where you can see an ST segment elevation in these leads, which you can clearly identify that a normal baseline is this, but the ST segment here has been elevated. It is seen classically in all these leads here. This is a pericarditis. Here again, you can see the ST elevation, but if you remember the previous ECG, look at the kind of ST elevation here. There is a convex ST elevation here, whereas in this, there is a concave ST elevation here. So this is a feature of pericarditis. With this, we come to an end of session two. And in the third session of this series, we will develop an algorithmic approach to a uh, uh, chest pain in this, in this uh, series. So thank you very much. Thank you for stopping by. And I hope you enjoyed watching this session as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Thank you very much and wish you all the best.